Hello, okay. Again, it is still a joy to be with each of you this morning. And thank you, Dan, for that introduction. And thank you so much to each of the panelists uh, for their presentation, their, their clinical vignettes and insights. And what about Dr. Safer's presentation to kick off our morning? How about a big round of applause? Thank you so, so, so much. You know, none of us get to where we're going in life. Certainly, I know I, I haven't. And so today's no exception. I brought with me my sister, Cheryl Sutton, who works as a therapist with the EAP program at Kaiser Permanente, where she is helping them develop their physician wellness program. Seated next to Cheryl, my sis, is a new friend and a new member of my family, and that is Dr. Shannon Remick, who is a psychiatrist at the Loma Linda VA, who is really pioneering some very, very uh, innovative and leading edge practices with respect to the suffering, alleviating the suffering of those who experience PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we'll get back to that later, but thank you so much for being here and being my little peanut gallery right here on the edge. Let me just start here, first of all, with this presentation. I've been so looking forward to coming back here to Loma Linda where it all started my journey of wholeness. Dr. Caper, when I saw your, uh, uh, your, your slide with the Good Samaritan sculpture, it took me back. It took me back to 1981. The sculpture had just been built and dedicated, and it took me back to those days, Harv, and who that Harv Elder would be here today. Will is here in spirit, we know that Harv. But so many times during the course of my medical training and education, I would walk around that, around that sculpture and see the Levite, the priest, the Samaritan, and the fallen the fallen, bleeding, and in pain, and suffering. And that's really where I started asking the question that's become my life quest. What does it mean to be whole? And so that's where I'm sharing with you today what I know today is different and less than what I will know six months or a year from now or down the line, but the operative word here is toward wholeness. I don't think any of us ever reach wholeness. None of us ever become the Good Samaritan. But it's, it's a quest, it's, it's striving, it's toward wholeness. And so my prodigal soldier psychiatrist journey of grace, grit, growth, and gratitude began here in this place, in this community. Who knew in the break that I, I met my father's college roommate, Dr. Robert Nelson? Where did you go, Doc, Dr. Nelson? Who told me the story of when my dad came into his college dorm room that day, was so excited. He had just gotten engaged. You guessed it, to my mom, LaVon. <laughs> Good catch, Dr. Nelson. More about them later. But you know, I. I love the Beatitudes, and I've kind of made up one of my own. Blessed, blessed are those who have grit, for they may grow. They may grow fully with grace and gratitude into the bounty of life's blessings. And what is that bounty? Ellen G. White. We all know. I know none of you ever called her Egg White. <laughs> Just a little confession. But who knew coming back to Loma Linda in, 19, in, in 2016, Mrs. White was named by the Smithsonian as one of the most influential 100 Americans of all time. And Mrs. White talked about the indivisible unity 
of body, mind, and spirit. She talked about her vision for Loma Linda University becoming a place where young men and women would come to learn, to be educated, to be inspired, to grow intellectually, and to commit their lives in service to humanity. We are blessed. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Seeing those legends, the Loma Linda legends. Another legend I met in the break, Dr. Sakala. I remember Dr. Sakala from medical school right up there. I also remember Dr. Sakala telling me at the break that he cared for my father during his last year of life. And then there was Dr. Bo Ying Watt, great pathologist, tennis player, inspiration. Joan Coggan, rest her soul, passed this last year. Ellsworth Wareham, so many. Dr. McPherson, so many giants of our legacy. And I just feel blessed to be with you all today and just share with you what I know. I want this to be interactive. I want you all to, well, let's, let me back off a little bit. I invite you all to just reflect on your own journey, your own journey toward wholeness. And I'll just share with you one little tip that I, I use for myself before starting any kind of presentation. And it has to do with grace, that unbidden, unearned gift. I'm a simple psychiatrist, so gee. Grounding. Yes, it is an ancient skill come to us from ancient cultures, but it's also a way for any of us, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, to sense into the strength and the solid firmness of the ground that is supporting us, the seats that are supporting us, the backs of the chairs are resource. My resource today, which makes me feel strong and confident and, and, and blessed, comes from Loma Linda. My grandmother lived up on Tulip. I'd go to her place often after school. She baked the best chocolate chip cookies. And she lived with Mrs. May Brewer, who had kind of a wrinkled paper that was on the mirror in the kitchen that I looked at every time I sat there and munched down on those cookies. And it went something like this. Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but to pour them all out, chaff and grain together, knowing that a faithful hand would take and sift through them, keeping what is worth keeping, and with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. So that is my hope for all of you here today keep what is worth keeping from the next 45 minutes, and with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. But that resource, I can smell the smell of those cookies. I can just feel her hug. I can see that wrinkled old paper with those words that have stayed with me for life. A, attunement. We've been here for the last couple of hours so wonderful to be able to attune to all of the richness, the feast that has been ours, focused on integrative health and wholeness. C, to connect, to be able to connect and share precious gems. As Will Alexander used to say, one beggar telling another where to find food. Today we've had a feast. And then E, to explore, to explore together, 
where do we go from here? We know where we've been. We're getting a sense of where we are, but where can we go from here? So that's the first slide, I promise. They won't all be that wordy. Oh, wait, I probably have to do this, don't I? Let's see. Dan? Can you? We usually have folks in the Army that do these things for us. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Would you mind just uh, uh, forwarding to the next slide? If we don't get to the next slide, don't worry. I'm, I, can, I can speak uh, uh, to you just like we are. I just have a few things that I want to share with you. I've shared a little bit of my journey. I think I'm trainable. Time will tell. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> My focus, you may have guessed by now, fueled and catalyzed by Dr. Kesey way back when in medical school, it's on veterans, mental health, resilience, trauma, wholeness. I've searched for wholeness ever since I started here at Loma Linda. This is not a solution, it's a, an approach, it's a model, the core four whole health model. I'll share that with you. Some challenges, some reflections. But first, I just want to dedicate this presentation to my folks. He probably looks a little familiar to you, Dr. Nelson. My dad. <laughs> I got so much from him. Reverence, irreverence. He was in the Army. But the irreverence, this ain't the Army. I always kept this on my wall through 30 years of the Army. He was a journalist. And uh, I just can't, can't tell you um, how fortunate I am, Cheryl and I are, to have had him as a dad. Well, of course, that leads to my mom. There she is, one, two, three, four from the left. Cardiac nurse, a member of the Loma Linda International Heart Team. There's. Dr. Wareham, there's Dr. Coggin. Oh, yeah, there's President Nixon, Congressman Pettis, the whole team there. Uh, you know, my mom, she was so proud of us. When I was in second grade, I wrote a little essay saying that when I grew up, I was going to be a nurse. She was so happy. And then years later, when I told her that I had decided to apply for medical school, she looked at me and she just said, Laura, not everyone has what it takes to be a nurse. <laughs> and she was right, by the way. <laughs> she was right. And then my roots. What I thought I would do, I told you I'm, I'm, I'm here today at a different place where, than I was just a few years ago. And Dr. Hart, you'll remember this well, shortly after I I retired from the Army after those 30 years. And I thought, you know, about a year and a half after I retired, I had the chance to, to go to Bellagio, Italy on a, on a Rockefeller Foundation fellowship. And I just want to share with you, these are, these are some thoughts. It was a brief blog that I, I, I wrote called Resilience, Repentance, and Reverence in Emerging Vision of wholeness. This is where I was then. I'm going to read it to you, Sharon. I timed it. It's about 10 to 12 minutes, but I think you'll, you'll find it perhaps a launching pad for your own reflections of your own journey and your own vision of wholeness. Sitting at my Villa Serbaloni studio porch, overlooking the majesty of nature's bounty that is everywhere in Bellagio, Italy, I pinned these thoughts on wholeness. The whistling wind underneath the balcony door signals that change is on the horizon. The myriad species of trees, large and small, olive, cedar, poplar, redwood, and magnolia, bow to the incoming storm with grace and aplomb. Spring's outrageous plumage, camellia, rhododendron, primrose, lilac, and wisteria smugly nestled into the rugged crooks and crannies of this pristine alpine setting. Change is life. Life is good. One of my fellow colleagues, roughly a dozen of us fortunate enough to be chosen by the Rockefeller Foundation as recipients of the Bellagio Fellowship, 
He's downstairs in the parlor playing one of Chopin's unpublished works, whose classical notes mingle with Andre Bocelli's intense tenor on my iPod, singing one of my favorite songs, The Prayer. Ah, yes, here comes the refrain. Lead us to a place, guide us with your grace, to a place where we'll be safe. In this moment, I whisper a prayer of love and gratitude, recalling Masaru Emoto's amazing photographs of water crystals, quote, filled with the most joy and his admonition that when you, quote, continually think thoughts of love and gratitude, you simply cannot help but be changed. Again, change is in the air and has been for these past 27 years since I strode with outward conf confidence across the graduation stage, 34 years now, 27 years then, to accept my medical degree as a proud member of the Loma Linda University School of Medicine class of 1985. In addition to vowing my allegiance to the Hippocratic Oath on that sultry morning in June, I also joined a far smaller group of fellow physicians who would likewise embrace a dual role, that of healing professional and commissioned officer. To do no harm, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So. Help me, God. Words to live by. Truly so. Looking back at my early years of growing up in Loma Linda, it is hard to fathom that I would become a career military physician. During this past 18 months since retiring from the Army in 2010, it has been hard to imagine not ever wearing a uniform again. Letting go of the past, making room for the future, change continues to beckon. Back in my room overlooking Lake Como, the sounds of Leonard Cohen's The Anthem now mix it up with the howling gust. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. A new meaning to these familiar words starts to emerge. Perhaps ringing the bell means it takes courage to keep up the fire. Achieving perfection is a delusion of hubris. Our flawed vessel is the crack of humanity, allowing light to enter and animate our soul. I whisper another prayer for a sense of wholeness and humility. Memories abound in this moment, recalling childhood glimpses of the advances pioneered by the University International Heart Team and its ceremonial visit to the Oval Office in 1968. Smiling at the thought of my mother's stint as queen for a day that yielded an essential heart-lung machine for the children in Pakistan. Fingering the yellowed pages of my father's work, chronicling the heartmenders during those early years. Pushing bits of Natina casserole around my jello streaked plate at the Calamesa Church potluck. Spitting watermelon seeds from the car window while accompanying my grandfather on his tireless routine of making house calls. That would be R. Leslie Ward, M.D., graduate of the College of Medical Evangelists, class of 32. Belting out soulful melodies of Mahalia Jackson, Elton John, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and the Heritage Singers in front of the living room stereo, reliving my early shyness and eventual acquiescence towards becoming a reluctant 
leader. Preparing to trade the comforts of home for the uncertainties of college life in Angwin, returning home to meet the rigors of basic training in <laughs> gross anatomy lab, circling the LLU Good Samaritan sculpture between classes while pondering what it means to make man whole. Recalling distant worship experiences at the White Memorial Church in Los Angeles among the restless renegades in Claremont and years later in sixth grade Sabbath school at the University Church, embracing the tenets of Will Alexander's pioneering journey of whole person care. May his memory be a blessing and its potential to heal at all levels, witnessing the power of baby phase baboon heart transplant and Dr. Leonard Bailey's courage to transform, catalyze, and accelerate global change. Feeling the profound loss of loved ones over these war-torn years. Reliving precious moments of serving those who serve us in harm's way. And finally, resigning my soul to the rueful pride of knowing myself and summoning the courage to live accordingly. It occurs to me that I am now where I was when, initially embarking upon my life journey toward wholeness, a path paved with resilience, repentance, and reverence. Resilience, what is it? Above the din of technical, scientific, and cultural jargon, the voice of a child known to me rings clear. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from tough stuff and to grow even stronger as a result. It's about having enough sleep, fuel, grit, friends, love, faith, hope, and growth. Tending the mind, body, soul, and spirit. For most of my professional life as a psychiatrist, the best I could do was to manage symptoms of distress. Talking therapies, biofeedback, medication, or a combination approach Given pervasive inadequacies of conventional modalities, and given the pervasive exposure to life-threatening traumatic stress within my military community, the inadequacies of conventional modalities lingered and nagged my conscience during deployments and on the home front. Years later, challenged with veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, suffering from complex injuries that would have proven fatal in prior conflicts, including repeated concussive blasts, burns, amputations, internal organ damage, vision and hearing loss, as well as moral injuries involving guilt, grief, and betrayal. I vowed that this escalating crisis would not obscure the clear and present opportunity for new therapeutic advances, as well as post-traumatic growth. In short, my quest involved searching for a different lens through which we can view, understand, and treat psychological trauma. Shifting the primary focus from pathology to biology, from blame to brain, from pills to peers, from clinic to community, from illness to injury, from betrayal to trust, from despair to hope. As the worsening military suicide epidemic reminds us, this is no academic matter. Lives are in the balance. Thankfully, advances in science and technology harnessed to the burgeoning field of neuroscience have now laid the foundation supporting our understanding of the biological basis for resilience and our responses to threat, loss, and fear. Restoring balance through the use of simple neurobiological skills, such as my grace gift, yields an essential foundation for self-regulation upon which optimal functioning within one's resilient zone depends. Interventions must go beyond cognitive restructuring and exposure therapy to include promising, innovative practices that are designed to stabilize the nervous system, a vital prerequisite for success at home, school, work, and play. As physician leaders, we must challenge ourselves to pioneer innovative and holistic approaches to health and healing to build the scientific evidence base of knowledge and applications to clinical care and to prepare our colleagues to provide hope 
and build resilience wherever they are called to serve. This is work indeed worth doing, a fitting tribute honoring the sacrifice of those from whose burdens of battle this emerging approach has been deemed gentle, humane, respectful, and effective. So back to our larger musings. If resilience is ours to build at all levels, where do repentance and reverence belong in this emerging vision of wholeness? To this end, let us briefly unpack repentance in the context of our journey as healing professionals in search of wholeness. Beyond the common usage of the term, that is, the individual process of seeking and granting forgiveness, starting with ourselves, as well as making remorseful amends for those whom we have hurt, perhaps it would be instructive to consider repentance in the words of Henry Beecher Stowe as another name for aspiration. As our forebearers rejected outdated practices like bloodletting, lobotomy, female hysteria cures in favor of adapting new knowledge to their practice of medicine, so may we likewise aspire to follow their example. Shedding the Cartesian model, a mind-body duality which still riddles far too much of clinical care, we must claim the privilege and exercise the responsibility to embrace this emerging vision of wholeness rooted in the new biology, epigenetics, and neuroplasticity of resilience. Beyond any doubt, we share a moral and ethical responsibility to offer hope, ease suffering, and promote healing through the use of gentle, respectful, and empowering approaches. Repentance is ours. Lastly, what can we say about reverence and wholeness? Drawing from the insights of classicist scholar Paul Woodruff in his books, Reverence, Renewing a Forgotten Virtue, and The Ajax Dilemma, Justice, Fairness, and Rewards. Reverence is the foundation of compassion, which grows from a felt sense of shared human weakness. Further, reverence is the well-developed capacity to have the feelings of awe, respect, and shame when those are the right feelings to have. Finally, if you desire peace, do not pray that everyone share your beliefs. Pray instead that all may be reverent. It is the virtue that keeps human beings from trying to act like God. As the sun now sets beyond the azure water and craggy horizon, punctuating this day's reflections on wholeness I am drawn to the comforting chords of that venerable hymn, It is well with my soul. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows, like sea, bellows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Bella Bellagio, with joy, love, and gratitude. So, 2012, my roots. Where am I now? Next slide, Dan, thank you. Oh, no, you gave it to me, didn't you? OK. <laughs> Trainable. So I get started in the Army. You're right, not the usual approach for an Army burgeoning career, but my first research project was animal-assisted care and treatment in an inpatient psychiatry ward at the Presidio of San Francisco. At that time, huh, it was 1985, but it hadn't been that long since <laughs> PTSD had been officially added to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the Bible of Psychiatric Diagnosis. It was the first disorder to include as a diagnostic criterion a traumatic event that is entirely external to the individual. As our soldiers today say, yeah, it's an injury. I'm not sick, it's an injury. And when I got to my residency training at Letterman, in 1985, 
I was taken back by this question that was in the corridors, it was in the conference rooms, it was between our faculty members, and it was, do you believe in PTSD? I thought, you know, if I wanted to go to a seminary, I would have made a different choice. What do you mean do you believe in PTSD? But that's where we were back in the 80s, as Dr. Saper so elegantly reminded us. Years later, I had the opportunity during the toughest times of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, 2007 through 2010, I was blessed to design and direct the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury. And at that point, uh, it was a new notion. <laughs> the brain has something to do with mental health. My own colleagues screamed at me when I introduced the thought that we should be concerned with the brain. Our colleagues on traumatic brain injury, they were screaming back saying, well, at least our disorder is real. I took my behavioral health colleagues in the back room and said, listen, in 2007, this would be like being a car mechanic and never opening up the hood. Come on, gang, let's get with it. Unthinkable today, just a few years later. And it turned out that the folks who were able to bridge that gap were the physical therapists and the, um, the physicians who were focused on rehabilitation because they didn't care about our tired turf wars. They just wanted to help our troops live lives of purpose, passion, and meaning. So it was quite a time those days uh, the crowning jewel of our work, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, it's in Bethesda. Go visit when you're on the East Coast. It's now become a global center. Uh, folks come from all over the country, all over the world, to study this integrative approach to psychological health and traumatic brain injury. This just gives you a little view of where we've come. You know, we used to, not too many years ago, all we had was just plain old CTs. Look at that CT, red as normal. Go to the right, now it's a routine MRI showing a possible lesion of the corpus callosum. Same brain to the right as the emerging imaging technology gives us now with the same brain the capacity to detect multiple lesions. The implication for this in my world, and perhaps yours as well, was in thinking back of all of my colleagues, of my patients, of their family members over the years who had been told that they were normal. There's nothing wrong. And so here we were, and we still are, in the midst of this revolution. What we are learning today is so much less than what we will know, not just in 10 years from now, but two years from now. And it's just one of the most exciting things I could imagine to be part of this. This is just another, this shows our functional imaging, the PET scan showing, you know, again, the difference between the normal brain and a brain that is affected by mild traumatic brain injury and severe. This is, this is a revolution in progress. It does cause us, or at least offers the opportunity to let go of everything we thought we knew was true and to embrace a different way of being, a different way of treating, a different way of living. Now that said, leading change is a journey not for the faint of heart. And by the time I left the Army in 2010, this being my final public event, which was at the opening of NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, I was, uh, I was broken. I was as far away from wholeness as I had ever been. 
and at my celebration of service, I refused to call it a retirement ceremony, I pulled this quote from Bobby Kennedy's Cape Town address, the last address he gave before he was killed, when he said, in the words of an Italian philosopher, read Machiavelli. In the words of an Italian philosopher, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in introducing a new order of things. And so, for those of us who have had the opportunity and privilege of leading change, let, let us just remind ourselves, we're not alone. We're not alone, and we need each other to move forward. So, moving forward, <laughs> against all odds, I just thought I was blessed 30 years in the Army, and then this crazy journey of fate, of providence, of hope, of serendipity happens, and I'm named as the commissioner for what was then the mayor's office of veterans affairs a tiny little office just four people strong been there for nearly 30 years mayors on both sides of the political aisle just let it languish in place and mayor de blasio you can see him here paul dubuca medal of honor recipient uh, every time i look at paul Buca, I, I think of i think of desmond doss our own sba conscientious objector, Army medic, and Medal of Honor recipient. Mayor de Blasio, you know, you go through the stations of, cross, of the cross to get all, you know, vetted and through the final hoops, and finally it's, it's an interview with the big guy. And I didn't know what this was going to be like. I mean, after all, I was new to New York. I brought no money. I not, brought no votes. I brought no, uh, you know, contacts. I brought nothing that mattered in a political world that I could see. What I didn't know is that Mayor de Blasio and his wife, Shirlane McRae, who has now pioneered the most comprehensive mental health roadmap in the world, 250 cities who have now gotten on board with Cities Thrive, I didn't know that all four of their parents had served in World War II. And that Shirlane's dad was an E7 in the plains of Europe, her mom was a Rosie the Riveter, worked in a factory in Massachusetts, the mayor's mom was fluent in Italian, worked in the early intelligence field. His dad fought in Okinawa and lost most of his leg and brought the war home with him. Died by suicide when the mayor was 18. So the two of them had in their mind's eye an absolute commitment, knowing the struggles and strengths, the blessings and the burdens of being part of a military and a veteran family. They wanted to bring somebody into that position who would make things different for today's veterans and their families. So by that measure, I fit right in. And his first question during that interview was kind of a, a version of, so what's a nice girl like you doing in the Army for 30 years? <laughs> and I told him about my first medical mentor Desmond Doss. And I told him that, you know, his wife had lived with my grandpa and grandma in Arizona and they were family friends and Desmond and his wife would come over for Sabbath dinners. And we would ask him, Uncle Desmond, Uncle Desmond, tell us about the war. And he would start in just like was the first time he'd ever told the story. Yeah, it was horrible as a garrison soldier. But he said, you know, when the bullets started flying, I had something, I had something to offer. Well, the mayor's listening to this. He said, did you say, did you say Okinawa? I said, yes. He said, that's where my father fought. And while we'll never know for sure, it just may be that my childhood mentor, Desmond Doss, our Desmond Doss, just may have been the army medic who saved the mayor's father's life. So what we've done 
This just shows we've gone from four folks to about 40 now. We will always remain a small agency within city government. We refuse to have a traditional organization chart with sort of the linear uh, hierarchy. Uh, but instead, we choose to put veterans and their families in the center. Everything revolves around them. We started out by saying it's all about relationships. And yes, it is now. We have the research to prove it, don't we now, Dr. Safer? So happy when the evidence lines up. And so we're just early on this journey. You're going to hear more about it because our nation is still at war. This just shows you the magnitude of our challenge. About three and a half million individual deployers, uh, army soldiers who have deployed, and of course that many families as well who have served on the home front since 9-11. The average days of deployment exposure. We know that that's the one factor that, that is the most predictive for post combat sequelae, whether it be anxiety, depression, post traumatic stress disorder, substance use. World War II, no one would ever say that our World War II heroes had it easy. Certainly not. Vietnam, certainly not. But look at the difference between the days of combat exposure, the days of exposure to fear, threat, loss, the days of having one's nervous system on fire, on overload. For our post-9-11 veterans, it is simply off the charts, which gives us the opportunity, and this is where Dr. Saber, I feel so optimistic about the way ahead. And I think we have work to do together as do all of us here because military medicine is replete with examples of how war-born innovations, we'd never want for war, but if it's here, what can we learn? And in this, our nation's longest set of wars, there is no such thing as clean PTSD and clean TBI, clean concussion, clean grief. No, it demands a whole person, whole health approach. And this is what I dedicate the rest of my days on this earth to doing. Post 9-11 mental health by the numbers, this is our challenge. Three and a half million folks who've deployed. 20% of them know that they need mental health services, meaning that they're at a diagnostic criteria. Doesn't mean that all of them aren't changed by war, for sure. But only half of the ones that know they need care will ever show up to a clinic. And of those who go once, only half of them will go a second time. Of those who go a second time, only half of them will experience a, a decrease in their symptoms, even with the current so-called gold standard treatments of cognitive behavioral cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure. So we got work to do. And yet we still have the barriers, whether it be the poor quality care, lack of access, the stigma. Don't you like that little emoji, a <laughs> little stigma guy? Just makes me want to just go over there and hug him, doesn't it? The sense of social isolation. And yet there is hope. Much like Dr. Safer had in his presentation, these are peer-reviewed public research studies dating from the, the 80s and 90s when there were very few, 46 up to this last year, well over 9,000 studies. Yes, hope is on the horizon. And when I got into this new position, we had enough evidence about what works now we just didn't have a model. So we thought, well, let's, let's come up with a model. So this is our model. It's the core four whole health model. You'll see that C4 clinical treatment is up at the top. I did not want some sort of a either or a real or Memorex division of clinical treatment and all of the rest. It's both and. Yet that's not where health, hope, and healing starts. And so this model is aimed at building out the bottom 90%, those social and other determinants of health that include transportation and nutrition, social support, 
employment, housing. And it's grounded in C1 culture, inspiration, the role of faith, engagement, and the arts. We've made a big, bold statement that culture and the arts and inspiration, the faith communities, it's not something that's just for these folks who believe this way, or in the case of culture and the arts, it's not just for the very lucky or the very affluent. It's not fluff. It's life itself connecting us to humanity and so much more. C2, connection, peer social support. This is the ideal, optimal point of entry into this model. It is not a linear model. It's dynamic. It's rooted in peer social support. And once you've buddied up our soldiers, their family members, then when they get a chance to go to a cultural or a faith a uh, service or a, an arts event, their buddy can say, you know, I thought it was kind of weird too, but it's pretty cool. Why don't you try it? That leads us to C3, holistic services, those things that Dr. Safer has talked about, and I would add in our military world, the role of equine therapy and service dogs, in the case of equine therapy, as they say, and you don't even ride the horse. Ask me about that in the Q&A. We'll have time for that in just a moment. But that's the biggest gap, and that's where we're working right now. It's a gap in knowledge, a gap in experience, and we want to bring this forward on a strength-based foundation of where we started. Grit. Blessed are those who have grit. In our world, that's growth, resilience, integrity, and trust. Even if you don't believe in all of that stuff that I just talked about, C1 through C3, just look at it through the, this lens. By focusing so exclusively on clinical care and treatment, you're at the highest end of the cost curve and the highest end of the stigma curve. And so we know we can do better and stay tuned. You're going to hear more about this going forward. We're working with the VA now and the Department of Defense and my battle buddy, Patty Horaho, former Surgeon General, and now Dr. Safer, and back here at Loma Linda. I can hardly wait to work with you all. We're not going to elaborate here. This just shows you a little example of the things that we've done. C1, Theater of War, I can talk about that with you if you're interested later. We put together for peer connection, mentor a vet to pair folks up. We also have veterans on campus to shine a bright light on the best practices academically throughout our city as well as the Career Council. I told you, Community Holistic Services, it's the, it's the weak link here in the chain to bring forward not just animal assisted but somatic expressive so much here and so much more that I've learned today to bring to this. And then clinical care. Our clinical lead here is the Headstrong Project. Some of you may have heard about Headstrong Project. It's free. It's now in 10 cities across the country. And it is the most integrative and trauma-focused care for veterans and their families. This is what we need to bring more to the VA and to the DOD, including other things like, of all things, psychotherapy assisted work with MDMA. Did you know that MDMA, yes, that's 3,4-methyldioxy, methamphetamine, ecstasy, molly, that street drug of the 80s? Do you know that this is, that has just been dubbed as a breakthrough practice by the FDA? It's now in, starting in phase three clinical trials in the United States, in Canada, in Israel, and our own Dr. Remick, right here in Loma Linda, is working with her colleagues to bring it right here. I'll tell you, I, you may have guessed, I get excited about this stuff. My disclosure, my passion explosion, ex explosion, my passion disclosure, as you said, Dr. Caper. And we're back. We're back to grace, gratitude, growth, grit. I don't know if we have any time for questions here. I'll certainly be around for a while. Let me just look at my keeper. Dan? This would be a great time for questions, so here we go. Let's talk among ourselves. Questions, comments, ideas? Yes. 
Ah, yes, the gentleman who asked about the, um, the financial and fiduciary <laughs> interest of being an entrepreneur in Thank this you, space. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. I appreciate Thank your you. very engaging presentation and um, uh, incredible journey that, 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 you, that you've been on, and thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, I, I've been thinking about your, your model, the C1 through, through C4, and one of the things that, that I've thought about as, as I've dealt with my own vets and, and those on disability is, is how important it is to have a sense of purpose. You know, I think of one patient, she's in her, her 40s, she yeah. has retired early, and she suffers from, from, from severe depression, from PTSD, and I've been meeting with her for, she's my patient for a year or two, and we're still struggling, yeah. still trying to figure things out. And she, and she says to me how she wished she was back in the Army because mm. she wakes up and she doesn't know what to do. She yeah. stands in her closet and she doesn't know what clothes to put on. And before it was very clear to her, she knew what she had to do when she got out of bed. She knew what clothes she had to wear. Um, now all that has been lost. And I, I, I think about, I, I wonder if uh, you have a sense, is there a way that you help people with their sense of purpose? Because that's what I seem to see in my clinical practice. Uh, as, as an Adventist Christian, we call it a calling, right? You have the sense that God has called you to something. In the Japanese culture, they call it ikigai, that thing that gets you out of bed. And I, I think that is a huge component as I consider whole person care. Dan, Peter, Dan Buehner from the Blue Zone says, hey, look, you can retire but you can never stop making a significant contribution. And I think that's a big part of whole person care. Oh, thank you so much for your comments and insights. And, and, and this is the challenge. And it's, it's a poignant challenge for veterans and their families. But I think looking across our country, it's a poignant challenge all over our country. Individuals, families, communities, casting about for a sense of purpose. What I have found useful, first of all, because I found it useful in my own brokenness, in my own journey toward wholeness, is to dig into this notion that you mentioned, calling. You know, callings are rarely convenient. I remember listening to Dr. Hart and the uh, two, uh, the dentist and the pediatric uh, forensic uh, specialist yesterday at the church uh, service and the dentist started these compassion clinics that have now spread the, the pediatric forensic specialist. She was called during her medical school rotation to adopt an abused child. It was her calling. So what I challenge both myself with as well as those veterans, their family members that I work with, I challenge them with, what is the world calling you to do now? We can talk about there I was and all the things that you enjoyed, that I enjoyed, that we can forever reminisce about in the military. But with all of the challenge, all of the suffering, all that's going on in our world right now, what is the world calling you to do? And to then marry them up in groups with community to marry them up for example for so many of us as veterans we're proud we don't want to admit that we need help well you know for any of us who have said so many times when our family members our loved ones our peers our co-workers have said you know have you thought about getting a little help oh no I'm good I'm good well you know back to that equine therapy you can say I'm good all you want but when the horse that's in front of you is moving this way with its ears back and it won't even make eye contact, you may not be as good as you think you are. Because after all, yes, equine therapy, you don't ride the horses, but guess what? That's not the point. Horses, as it turns out, are animals of prey. And as such, they are exquisitely attuned to any threat, any perturbation, any disturbance in the environment that may affect their survival, including irritability, including undigested trauma. And so it's almost like a biofeedback with the animal, with the veteran, restoring the capacity for 
safe and trusting relationship. First, with the horse, then recognizing, oh, it's not the horse that changed, it's I who changed, and then taking that into the world of work and family and peers. So, for any of you who work with veterans and their families, just know this. It's fine to say thank you for your service. That's a wonderful thing to say, particularly given what our brothers and sisters coming back from Vietnam experienced. But the next words maybe could be, I'm so glad you're home. We need you here and now. Hire a vet. Get them engaged with community. Tie them to a mentor. And yes, if they need clinical care, whether it be a uh, you know, a checkup, whether it be a maintenance visit or an overhaul, they're not alone. They're connected with a buddy. So it comes back to community. It comes back to the experience of community. And I will, I will just say this, that this is one of the things I want to follow up, both with colleagues here at Loma Linda and Dr. Uh, Saper. A few years ago, I had a chance to talk with Eric Kandel. Many of you know his work as a psychiatrist, Nobel laureate. He did a lot of work on memory and learning with the aplysia snail. And we were at the Fountain House, which is a community center for severely mentally ill folks that harnesses community, the experience of community, that purpose that you mentioned, as their strongest medicine. Not in place of medicine, it's just that at Fountain House, it's work. It's community, it's purpose, it's passion, it's meaning. And so I asked Dr. Kandel, I said, you know, I've admired your work for such a long time. What do you think it's going to take for us to do the research to understand the impact and the power of community? He looked at me and he said, you know, I've thought a lot about that. He says, it's relatively easy to study snails. He says, this is the challenge of your generation. And if I can help, I'm here. I haven't gone back to Dr. Candell yet, but I'm thinking the timing might be just about right for us to really take on that challenge so that we can take the experience of community. It's what Lola Linda has in spades. Cheryl and I went to a, we got a massage two days ago, and the, the, the massage therapist, you know, you're from New York, what are you doing? First of all, you brought the bad weather, but you know, what's going on here? I said, I'm coming back to my alma mater. And I'm learning about wholeness on Sunday morning. And she says, oh, well, Melinda University, my baby was in the NICU for 10 days, and she said, it was the nurses who loved my baby to help. Those nurses, again, I didn't have what it took. Mom was right. But this is the community. These are the ties that bind. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And I just want to say, um, you know, Dr. Hart, the theme of this, uh, this homecoming, this one homecoming mission possible, you're speaking my language. Let's take that hill together. I'll be on the high ground, the one with the big grin. See you there. Oh, have, I was just, that have, was, I was rounding have, up. We got two questions, we two, okay. Two quick questions, oh, oh, one okay. here and then one here. Yes, sir. A year after I graduated from here in 1968, I was a battalion aid surgeon uh, out in the U.S. Army in Vietnam, 1969-70, so I really appreciate what you've done for the veterans. Uh, I have a number of veterans in my practice. I've made a DVD of my experiences there, which include a lot of MedCap, uh, civilian assistance love. program in Vietnam and uh, also what it was like living in a tank, their armored personnel carrier and riding around in the busting jungle and so on. Uh, one of my patients was a B-52 radar navigator uh, dropping bombs while I was down on the ground, feeling the rumble on, <laughs> around me of the, B the bombs going off and uh, showed a little bit of video of the clouds of smoke coming up from the areas where they were devastating with these bombs. But and what it's like to fly over these areas, just look at the, assess the damage. But uh, anyway, appreciate your service to the veterans there, because I know a lot of them are not uh, doing well because of their experiences in the Army there and other services. So thank you.
will thank you and thank you and your generation. It's been our Vietnam brothers and sisters, you and your brothers and sisters, who have helped us mature as a nation, who have separated out support for the warrior from support for the war, who have greeted our families, sent them off at the airports, who have guarded the sanctity of our memorial services. And I just want to thank you. And I work a lot with the Vietnam Veterans of America, and I just love the mantra. Never again will one generation of warriors turn its back on the next. Thank you for your service. We're glad you're back. We need you here yeah. and now. We have two more, the yes. one there and then here. We're going to, okay, let's, uh, it, we have to quickly uh, wrap it up though to get people to lunch by 1130. So some quick questions. Okay, uh, quick. Orange first. Power round. Okay, thank you for the presentation. In your presentation, I hear echoes of things that resonate that pertain to physician wellness, mm -hmm. the stress, the burnout, the hours, the exposure, and so forth. So here's the thing. I find it interesting that you and Cheryl, um, of course, they're sisters, but Cheryl, if I understand correctly, you're, you're working with physician wellness at Kaiser. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very curious, just in a snapshot, to hear what's the synergy between you and Cheryl and the things that you shared oh and goodness. the things that Cheryl is dealing with. OK. Let's meet after. Let's meet at lunch, shall we? Thank you for the invite. Thank yes, you. absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for noticing that. We, as we've sipped postum in our jammers over the last couple of days, we've wondered over that ourselves. Yes, so and, Dr. And, yeah, so my question is about action. I, I'm glad someone mentioned earlier a question at the beginning about the government's role in mm -hmm. health care and regulation. And, First, I'll just add that I, I do have a connection to Loma Linda. I matched here for residency. So not only the veteran connection, and psychi I'm a psychiatrist, but I did train here, and I military family as well. Loma Linda feels like home, and that's why I stayed. So, you know, the community is strong in myself. But what he, the question about, you know, we have all these answers, and we know that access to clean air and water and nutrition and education and time for rest and everything, those are health care needs, and those are mental health needs that we all as humans require so what do we do do we need to write a letter to congress you know put you know maybe that's going to be my hell my free time to 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 write letters that we have answers and what are we going to do about it to really change the model where the money's going where our time is going you know not writing notes well let me just say this um thank you i don't know about you all without verging into politics i would just say that in my view, cities today are where the action is. And it's by demonstrating what right can look like that we can then have the substance, the basis for letters to Congress and for members of your generation. I got to tell you, when I met you this morning, I just said, thankfully, the next generation of psychiatrists with this passion for wholeness and integrative medicine has arrived. And we will take that hill together. We have to. Our very lives depend on it. Let me just, let me just close. I, I have one last slide. And this is a, a story about mom at Loma Linda. In the end, she had a brain tumor. And Dr. Walter Johnson, some of you know Dr. Johnson, was her surgeon. And her college roommate had just had heart surgery and said, LaVon, my surgeon let me open my Bible and put it in the OR about you? And my mom said, yes. And Dr. Walt, Dr. Johnson says, of course. And so we said, well, what, is, what do you want to open to, mom? And she says, Acts 8.28. Lori and I are looking at, I mean, Cheryl and I are looking at each other and saying, Acts 8.28, what is that? Cheryl called a minister friend of hers. I called Will Alexander and said, maybe it's Romans 8.28. And my mom said, oh, yeah, well, remember, she had a brain tumor after all. Okay. <laughs> she went through her surgery with the Bible open and with this just wondrous verse that I think brings together so many things that we've talked about today. You know, we know that all things work together for all who love God and are called according to his purpose. This is what Loma Linda means to me, continues to mean, lives on, and now to just learn about so much that's going on so many other places, now is the time, gang. 
Let's take that hill. Let's share the word. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless.